Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. And this week's episode is kind of a winter State of the Union um, discussion about what I saw last week in New England. So it's December, it's 2023, and I spent last week with uh, Prep Athletics OG, uh, my father, Big Mike, going to New England for eight days. And during that trip, we visited 21 prep schools, Got to go to the New England Scholar Round Ball Classic uh, in Boston. Got to see a lot of teams play. Got to see 14 of my clients play. Um, got to meet a lot of them for the first time. And it was just a great trip, which I take every year to go to new schools, to visit schools I've got partnerships with um, that I've sent kids to in the past, where I've currently got kids, and places where I know the coaches and we're buddies. This trip, um, I also wanted to focus on junior boarding schools. That's a market I don't know much about, but for those of y'all that have not heard about junior boarding schools before, they are actual boarding schools for 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth graders. Uh, the 5th might be day students, but 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth are boarders that go to prep school to get ready for secondary school. Now, secondary school is what you and I call prep schools. That's ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, and postgrad. Um, so some of these schools I've visited um, – get kids ready for that. They get them away from home. They board there. They do a lot of outdoor activities, sports, um, a lot of good education, a lot of being around kids from different cultures. So I didn't know much about this world, and I really not had many people at that age group reach out to me. But I know no more about them now, and it's it's impressive. I mean, I particularly um, don't want to be uh, – I'm not going to be the parent that probably most likely – or I'm not going to send my kids away – for junior prep school, but I can see now what kind of clients could take advantage of it, and it's a pretty good asset. So I've got a better skill set on that now. If you have any questions uh, or uh, want any more feedback on that, reach out to me, and I'll do the best I can to help you on that. So um, aside from there being uh, the visit last week where I got to see a lot of good action on the court, got to meet the coaches and some of my clients, I want to go over some things right now that have been uh, being discussed with families asking me questions uh, stuff I see happening now within the prep school world and some advice and feedback based on some experiences some of my kids are having. So first thing, I had a kid from overseas looking at a prep school in Maine that I put him touch, in touch with. And one of the concerns they brought up was the shooting that just happened there um, a few weeks ago where the gentleman went into the bowling alley and uh, did a lot of damage there before um, eventually being found. But the prep schools in New or in Maine during that time were on lockdown, and a lot of kids were kind of nervous about it. But this foreign family said, we don't want to send our, our child to Maine because of the gun violence there. And I said, look, I, I hate to say this about my country, but there's gun violence everywhere now, and it's not just Maine. Maine is actually probably one of the safer states as far as those statistics go, which I do not have in front of me, so don't quote me on that. But I said, unfortunately, with America, it's something you have to look at, and you cannot turn a blind eye to it. So there's probably been a shooting in almost every state. But that's a concern a foreigner had about our country, which is too bad. But it is the reality. And especially when you look at school shootings as well, it's a concern. Now, as far as I know, there's not been a school shooting at a boarding slash prep school yet. Um, I Don't quote me on that. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, but sometimes the outside world can uh, get into certain prep schools and whatnot. So just wanted to point out that this is a concern a foreigner had and it's it's a valid concern um, and it's too bad but yeah I said even though you're looking at schools in Maine I wouldn't worry about it but can I really say it with 100% confidence anymore um, so yeah guns in America was the first thing that I thought was an interesting yet sad question to have to answer um, number two um, I've got a client right now that's a postgrad going to a prep school and the playing time is not what they thought it would be so they reached out to me and asked me for suggestions. And my suggestion when it comes to playing time or any issue with the basketball team is to first have that player you know, go into the coach's office, sit down with him, and ask him, hey, 
Why am I not playing as much? And what can I do to rectify that? What can I do to get minutes on the court? I guarantee you this coach wants you to play. He wants you to do the things that he brought you to the prep school for initially. So go in there and have a conversation with him. And it might be as simple as, hey, you need to do A, B, and C, and you're not doing it. Or it could be something else. But until you let the coach know that you've got a concern about your playing time, how's he going to know otherwise? Okay? Postgrads do get played. There will be film on you. The coach does have to place you at the end of the day. But you got to have that conversation. you got to make sure you're doing everything you're doing too. The person that reached out to me about this is a father. And I notice sometimes, just by doing this for years, that kids see things differently than the coach does, right? So a kid might say something to a father through the kid's lens that might be completely off base with what a coach is thinking. And sometimes you just need to sync both parties together to get on the same page. And a lot of times that helps, okay? But at the end of the day, if you're a postgrad not playing, that coach still has to place you, okay? So just make sure you're getting minutes. Um, if you're on a place with two teams, maybe get on the second team and get some more minutes in. That has to be a conversation you have to have. You have to have. But your parent calling the coach, you can do that. But I wouldn't suggest it. Me getting involved, I'm. I'm just going to ask the coach what he thinks. I'm going to have the coach and the player work it out. So in playing time for post grads, have a conversation with the coach. That goes across all levels: regular high school, college. Um, talk to the coach first. They're going to know exactly, exactly why you're not playing. And when I used to coach high school ball. We knew exactly what kids needed to be playing and why, and why other kids weren't playing. And we could see how there was a disconnect sometimes with the families in the stands versus the team. But everybody on the team pretty much knew who was playing and why due to all the time we had in practice, the attitudes, the hustle, everything. So usually your kid knows why. You just might be getting a different story as well. Okay, so just remember that. Now, I've also got a a client who went to a prep school who's an underclassman who doesn't like his future there. Um... You can only do so much looking at film if you're me and a prep school coach. When the kid gets on campus, that's when you can actually see them in person. And this kid uh, who's gotten on campus uh, went to a pretty good school. And the coach is like, look, it's going to be tough for you to get varsity minutes because you're not the skill level yet I need. Plus, we're trying to turn this into a program that gets a lot better. And we're going to be bringing in even better guards that we have now. So... Just letting you know your future here does not look bright as far as playing time goes. We'd love to have you here. You can play in our secondary program, but that's the reality. So what should that kid do? Well, um, one, he needs to keep working on his game, uh, working on his strength, his IQ, stuff he can handle. He can also go out there, and if he's not worried about, you know, if he can't affect the game scoring, there's all the other things you can do in the game of basketball to help you do better and get playing time as well. But if he does not see a sign that playing and staying at this school makes sense, you might need to move and look at other options. And since he's already gone through this process once, he now knows the questions to ask. Since he's in an American prep school now, he knows you know what things he might want and not want in a future prep school. And if we decide to work together again, we can narrow down um, to a better fit. So I don't mind kids transferring if it's not the right fit for him. Just like the coach didn't know you know, this kid's skill set fully based on his film, this kid might not have known fully what experience he was getting at prep school. We don't have a crystal ball, right? We don't know how these prep school experiences are going to work for kids. We don't know where these kids are going to end up in college, right? So we're all making decisions with the knowledge we have, and we're trying to do it the best of our ability. But there are kids that are going to end up, you know, potentially picking a program they think they like when once the reality sets in, they've been there a few months, it just might not be the right fit. That's okay. That happens you know, to a few kids every year, and it's not a perfect process. You do the best you can to find the right fit, but if you're going through it and don't see a future, that might be a time to you know, reevaluate. So that's an example of a post-grad with playing time situation and an undergrad. And let's talk about a worst-case scenario here. I say over and over again that prep schools are responsible. The coaches are responsible for placing you at a college, the right fitting college at the right time. If you need a supplement to this, if you don't want to be just in the region that the prep school might be um, located in because that's where the coach is going to have the most contacts, you can hire a group like College Athlete Advantage to help you, right? It's a separate service you can hire. They only take on kids. They know they can place in college. But we've just had Steve Schaefer on the podcast, uh, most recent podcast, and he breaks down how they help place their players in college. 
I've had a couple prep school kids that have used them as a supplement to help with the prep school coach. And the prep school coach loves this. It's less bandwidth they have to spend placing you and they can work together to find the right fit for you as a player. So look at the podcast I had with Steve Schaefer. It's College Athlete Advantage. Um, I think they do a pretty good job. They don't take on everybody. They only take on kids they can place at the next level, which is college. So I think they're doing great work. So that's something else you can always think about if the playing time's not there or you don't think the prep school coach is doing the, the exact job you need them to. Go ahead and look at that as an option. Third thing, all right, whenever I reach out to coaches on a kid's behalf, <laughs> on a kid's behalf, is um, is you know a kid talks to three to five coaches and then we help narrow that down and then a kid and a family ultimately pick the right fitting prep school for them. All right, once a kid has decided on a prep school, they need to call, not text, but call the other coaches that have taken time out of their lives to recruit the kid. Okay, so if I've had a kid that talked to five coaches and he's narrowing it down to two schools and ends up doing one, he needs to pick up the phone and call the other four coaches, thank them for the time, and said, hey, I appreciate it, but I've actually found a school that's a better fit for me, and that's where I'm going. Too many times this fall, I've told kids to do this, and I've had coaches reach out like, hey, what's the word with, with Johnny? And Johnny, it turns, never made that phone call to let the coach know that he was no longer interested and he was going somewhere else. And I don't like this. I wish the kids would do it. But this is the reason we're doing this is you've got to get used to making difficult calls in your life and guess what even sooner than just you know living life as an adult you're gonna have to make a coaching or a college choice at some point and you're probably gonna have multiple colleges recruiting you you're gonna have to pick up that phone and you're gonna have to call the colleges you're not going to and say hey thanks so much for putting the time into me I'm actually going to another school and it's good manners it's uh, good karma in the basketball world that the coaches appreciate uh, you reaching out, and it's a good muscle to kind of strengthen on making difficult phone calls because you got to do that in life as an adult, and it's just the right thing to do. But be mature. Don't ghost them. In fact, coaches like getting these calls because they know how tough it is for kids, and it's a sign of maturity to be able to do that. Fourth point, when I looked at these, these prep school rosters this past weekend in Boston at the Scholars Round Ball Classic, um, there were a lot of kids there from New England and New York and Pennsylvania and that region of the country. Prep schools, the coaches, the admission departments are just really wanting to get kids from outside the New England region because they want their schools to be as diverse as possible. So if you're a kid in Connecticut at 6'3", 3.0 grades, and you're good, but you're that same kid, that same clone from a state that's not represented at the prep school, they're going to take that kid um, that's a little bit more diverse regionally because it just adds more to the school, right? So I really, I saw that this weekend. Some schools have all kids from Massachusetts or all kids from New York or a lot of, most of their kids from New Jersey. Diversity is key. So if you're from an area outside that region, you're going to be looked at more favorably because you're more exotic, right? And the last thing um, I kind of learned during this week was that NEPSAC, which is the league up in New England, uh, the New England Prep School uh, Athletic Conference, they voted, all the 80s voted unanimously to allow year-long training uh, within basketball. Now, I'm not sure of the legality of this. This is a rumor I heard. I don't even know if it's official yet or going to be official. But now schools can choose when to start practicing basketball and how often to do it during that school year. Now, you hear a bunch of different trains of thoughts on this. Here's one of them. One is my clients and a lot of the kids out there going to prep schools for basketball only want to play basketball and they're paying money. They're coming from all over the U S and all over the world. They want to do it from day one, whether it's playing, whether it's skill set, whether it's practicing, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's conditioning, they want to do all that. And this now, if this goes through, will give coaches at each prep school, the freedom to decide how they want to do it. There are other prep schools where it's still going to be required to play three sports, one in the fall, one in the winter, one in the spring. Right. And there are benefits to that. Right? You don't want to burn out and hear a coach's voice for nine months. Okay, You can get injured doing the same move over and over again by playing one sport. So there are advantages of doing multiple sports. There's also advantages of spending all your time specializing in the other sport. So this is not a debate about which one is better, but prep schools here in the future, it looks like the coaches are going to have a chance 
to train as much as they want to, when they want to, how they want to, and not be beholden to NEPSAC's kind of antiquated rules of not starting practice until a date in October. So that's kind of the latest. That's what we did uh, last week in New England. It was a great trip. I learned a lot. There's other information, too, that we'll be sharing in, um, in blogs and in, in tweets and in social media and in future podcasts. But those are the ones I wanted to talk about today. So thesis sentence and all this, you know, there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts always. you got to keep up with this stuff. you got to know where the bodies are buried uh, within the prep school world and which places to avoid and which places to go towards. But seeing these games this weekend, too, let me know, like, there are teams with multiple D1 players on it, sometimes in the double digits. There are other teams that don't have those players but still play really hard, and there's everything in between. So all these teams have kind of a personality of coaches and a personality of how they play, and knowing those intricacies is really how prep athletics can help a family, you know, picking the right prep school. So if you liked all this, be sure to subscribe to the newsletter. Go to prepathletics.com comes out once a month we had a new fancy one last month and uh, they're going to be a lot of fun moving forward and subscribe on the youtube channel to make sure you never miss out and uh, it is now going to be uh, end of december when this comes out if you're trying to go to prep school for next year a lot of applications are due uh, mid-january beginning of february so time to get moving on that so thanks for tuning in we'll see you next time